What is up you guys? Rizzi here with Culture Fuzz. Thank you so much for joining me back here on my channel. As you can see, the Culture Fuzz family is growing and I'm so excited, I'm so happy, I'm so honored that I'm reaching more and more of you and you guys are participating in the conversation and it's been amazing. amazing. If it's your first time here, make sure you hit that subscribe button and that bell notification so you always get notified when I put up new content. And you guys, we need to keep the likes coming and make sure you like this video. The YouTube algorithm is a very, very hefty beast. And the more likes that I get, the more that YouTube is going to push this content. And people need to hear these conversations. People need to hear more about being vulnerable and connecting. And it's okay to open up and reach out to other people and speak to other people. So with your help, we can get that message across. On today's episode, I have a very amazing guest. His name is Ian Guerin. He is a singer-songwriter from Mexico who is a multi-award winner, has been in multiple publications, has been on the UK charts more than once, and he has just released his sophomore album. You guys, the Culture Fuzz conversation that I had with Ian is so compelling, so real, so raw, so vulnerable. He talks about not only his music, but his journey getting there and how he developed tools to overcome some of his mental obstacles because you don't win multiple awards or get in multiple publications by just putting your music out there and just sitting there. So if that is something that you want to hear, if this is a conversation that you want to have, make sure you stay tuned. I don't know if you had a chance to kind of like read what I'm about or like what my blog is about, but just so you kind of understand what my platform is about. Um, uh, it's Culture Fuzz and I work to bridge the gap to people, places, products, and philosophies I know are going to make a quality difference in people's lives and the way that you were brought to my attention was through I don't know how you know Keno Keno Thomas on Facebook I'm not sure if he's like a very strong supporter or like what the case is either way divine intervention I don't <laughs> believe things happen randomly I definitely think things happen for a reason regardless of what the vessel is so he was the one that introduced me to you and to your music and was really adamant about me interviewing you. So I said, okay, I get the message. Let me see what he's about. And uh, watching your interview um, with, I want to get the name right, with the Anything Goes Project. Uh, Michael Simmons. Michael Simmons. Thank you so much. I definitely <laughs> want to shout him out. I, I absolutely love his podcast. Michael, small brand, a small brand, small, you know, trying to we have the same message. We have the same, uh, idea and philosophy. So like, yeah, like totally grateful for that. But that was what really, I was like, yo, he's really dope. I like, not only is his music cool, but I like your mindset. You You're very profound. You're very like socially conscious and environmentally conscious. Um, do you do like self-development or like, do you, are you privy to that? Uh, no, I just work on myself a lot because I got a very noisy mind. And I've, as I as I told him, I had been very troubled in the past. So ever since that, you know, like you get to an awakened state where everything matters and everything is connected in a way. So yeah, I can't worry about myself and my mental health and not then come, uh, you know, planet Earth and not worry about where the trash is being placed and, you know, what people are doing and what governments are doing and everything comes hand in hand, I believe. So that's amazing. That's huge. Only because um, I know where are you where are you right now? Are you in Mexico? I'm in Mexico right now. OK, OK, because yeah. I don't know if you're aware, but there's like um, I'm going to go ahead and call it a fad right now, like a self-development fad like happening in the United States right now that um everything is about like, you know, positive thinking and working on yourself and uh, developing awareness and stuff like that. But it's kind of become very fluffy and very like um, avoiding doing the really hard work and having those super hard conversations with yourself and feeling those really like dark feelings that you have to work yeah. through. People are just yeah. like, oh, just positive thinking and I'll be fine. So I yeah. commend you for that, for kind of like, developing that type of mindset and having that own awareness like is there anyone in your family or anyone in your life that kind of like influenced that way of thinking or that mindset my sister does it now but she's the only one like mm -hmm. we're the only ones in the family and the whole family like and it's a big family yeah and we're the only ones who got that like really down because she's in she's in film so we get we get a lot of people who are trying to find their way inside their own minds so yeah. 
yeah. we met we've met some people who are into that too and you know and my 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 mom's best friend is also very aware of it and very awake and she's very 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 awake yeah so yeah because it's, so. it's funny because like you use certain terminology and words and I was like huh okay he's woke <laughs> like he's woke I see okay um yeah. okay I digress so I you're my first musician actually on the show so um Ian how do you pronounce your last name like how do you properly pronounce it Garen it's Garrett. Okay, I thought it was gonna be like Garin or like something like I don't know, something like. It's French <laughs> and it's supposed to be some other way, but I, you know, I never met anyone who was named like that and you right. know was French, except from my family. You know, my ancestors, but they're dead. My grandmother, my grandfather, and stuff. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. No, that's super interesting. So, is that your mix? Are you Mexican and French, or? Yes. That's dope. Okay. Very cool. So I know that you're fluent in English and you're fluent in Spanish. Are you fluent or do you know any French? No. No? <laughs> no. We. Oui. That's, that's all I got. Moi. Like, <laughs> um, um. <laughs> so thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, to my viewers out there, Ian, he is a... Um, Actually, I don't even want to say that you're an up and coming singer. You've kind of like been in the game for a while now. So I'm going to let you do your own introduction. Go ahead and let my viewers know who you are, what you're about, what you're working on. Well, I've been a, a recording artist for more uh, for over uh, 10, 15 years now, since I was nine. Mm -hmm. And I started recording demo albums. And then uh, I decided that I was going to go formally into music around like 2008 or nine, maybe. And I met my producer uh, back then through a friend. And uh, I'd, I'd recorded before with with another producer who actually did my demo albums. Mm. But um, but for like my own music, the first time that I really did a song that I was really into was with Asmir Van Gord, my my current producer, and I met him through a friend, and we started doing singles, and then I I went to college for a bit. I'm a college dropout. So, Same here, know. no worries. It's and not <laughs> uh, and I wanted to go I wanted to go to college because my mom wanted me to go to college mm. and do the same thing that she did, and so I tried. Uh, international relationships. I don't know if that's what it's called. I think like, it's inter international relations. Yeah, I, I know. It's interna well, I don't know. Yeah, international interna relations, I think. Yeah, Yeah, international relations, sorry. And uh, I don't want to seem like all ignorant on that, but I didn't oh, really no, care for that. <laughs> and I remember I remember being in class one day and uh, he said, well, you're going to be the next ambassadors and the next councils and the next, you know, whatever. And I said, whoa, this is so not for me. And I walked out of class and then I start, uh, started doing uh, graphic design and I didn't like it either because they wouldn't let me sign my, you know, my designs. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is my, you know, I'm going to be somebody. So why are you not letting me sign those? And I, right. I, at the same time, I was recording with Osmo some tracks that we weren't uh, releasing to the public. And then uh, there was like this, some sort of flu that came from, from pigs. And oh, so... Uh what is was the swine flu or something like that swine flu i think yeah swine flu and uh we had to you know everything was closed and we went to to our townhouse and uh and then i met asmir there and we started working you know i hadn't uh formally met him when we started you know talking on the phone and stuff and then i came to the studio and we recorded some stuff and he said, oh, you're brilliant. He doesn't believe that I'm brilliant anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, he does. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just get on his nerves a lot. And you then, guys have been working uh, closely for a while, I can tell. <laughs> yeah. For, that's been like, it's been like over 10 years now oh my that gosh, I've met yeah. him. Yeah. So, yeah, that's he knows me well. And yeah. he's very funny. He's also, uh, you know, how do you call these people that don't like to come out of his, their home? <laughs> Introverts. I think. No, when like they don't actually hermits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 so I give him a hard time, and you know he doesn't. He's not always pleased to see me, but you know we're always pleased to work with each other because he really gets me and he's really talented. So we did that song called Bubblegum, and then we decided to release it 
And that's how it all happened. I uploaded it to a page called uh, Sound, uh, iSound, and it started doing very well. And I started playing it for my friends and stuff. And they, they were like, oh, you did this? And I was like, yeah, well, the lyrics are ish. I don't know if I can say, like, ish. Oh, <laughs> are what? Like, no, like, like s-h-i-t <laughs> oh you are you can cuss as much and as freely um, as you can yeah i it's it's an explicit show go for it yeah <laughs> yeah you know i feel like the lyrics are shit but the song is actually really strong it, it got a good hook and you know people liked it and it was like really flowy and right you know like bubblegum it was called and and then we did another single called i heart and then we started thinking about putting a record together and uh, we did. It turned out well. I think it's a good record, the Mad Sexy record, but that was like around 2011. Mm. And then when I released it on August 29th, 2012, which I actually, today is August 28th, and I actually want to say that uh, the reason why it was uh, released uh, seven years tomorrow, it's his seventh birthday, wow. uh, it was because Michael Jackson's birthday is on August 29th. So it was sort of a, like a tribute to him. <laughs> I see. That's dope. That's dope. Michael is a huge influence to your music or? Yeah. yeah. He's, he's my idol. Yeah. I yeah. can't. He's the only person in the world that I like to see every day. <laughs> right? Like, it's, uh, rest in peace, man. We do miss you. So yeah. speaking of your music, I listened to Irreplaceable. Is that your sophomore record or? That's my sophomore record. Okay. Okay, your sophomore record. Okay, I listened to it in its entirety. I like to listen to artists Thank because you. I think that um, the the approach of creating an uh, entire album as an entire project where yeah. it kind of goes together, that's kind of been lost. And uh, I was very pleased to hear that the album sounded very well-rounded, like the sounds were consistent, the approach was consistent. Um, it was done very well, mixed very well, and um, one of my favorite songs, what was it called? I was humming it on the way. It was Roll the Dice. Roll the Dice uh, was like, like everything was cool. Like you definitely, there's like an R&B swing to it, and um, it was very nostalgic, and it gave me an insight to who your influences might be, and I was listening to um, the, and I was listening to the Anything Goes Project, and they were say, uh, you guys were talking about how Aretha Franklin was kind yeah. of one of your big influences and hearing that Michael Jackson is one of your big influ influences. I was like, ah, there it is. So and I princess up with too. Music like that. And pr I can definitely, definitely hear some Prince notes in there. There's like yeah. a mellow undertone to uh, your sound, but there's still a swing to it. And I was like, that's so Prince. Like, Prince was very cool, very just like chill, but he gave you just enough. You're just like, ooh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, it was very. Completely I, agree. Yeah, I I love it. Okay. It was great, and understanding and knowing now that your father was more influenced by rock, like the Who yeah. and the Beatles and stuff like that. So I was curious to know where did you start listening to music like Aretha Franklin, Michael Jackson, or how did that come into play in your life? I think it was actually because of Michael, and he was the first one that I listened to. Of mm -hmm. course, I remember being very young and my mom having a Mariah Carey Greatest Hits record in her car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I learned afterwards that she didn't actually like her, but someone had given her the record, so she had it. And but, but I remember divine intervention. Her, yeah, <laughs> I remember seeing Mariah there and just thinking, well, well, what does she do? And then my sister, who was actually you know in the Michael Jackson concert when he came down to Mexico, and uh, she went there. I was really little. I I I, I didn't go, but. You know, she she used to like uh, black or white and smooth criminal a lot. So uh, around 2001 or maybe 2002, I told my mom, I want to I, I want to get my my sister a Michael Jackson record. So she took me to a record store and I was looking for a record that actually had smooth criminal and black or white in it. And uh, they didn't have any. And I learned afterwards that the only uh, compilation that actually had it at the time was uh, the history but the double one the, the double record oh okay yeah yeah the, like the golden one with yeah yeah 
And they didn't have that one. They had like a, a stripped out version of the greatest hits, like volume one with the shoes. And, and it, oh, wow. it didn't have the, the both songs that I needed. So I ended up uh, getting Invincible. And I got her Invincible. And that was the new Michael Wright Jackson record at the time. And and when I got, got, I got her the album, and I was like, well, but I got you the new stuff. And I was really little. And she said, what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want the you. And so she didn't like it. And she gave it to me. And she just left it there. And now that I think it through, it was a gift. And she should have kept it. But she didn't. <laughs> and <laughs> You're like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And thanks to that. I played the record and I enjoyed it, and that was the first time that I came by the music of Michael Jackson with the Invincible album, mm -hmm. and uh, I liked it a lot, and I liked the sounds. I just liked the sounds yeah. to it. It had yeah. like a groove, and then I started, you know, searching for m more music that sounded like that, and then his special came up on TV like in November, and and I saw all these artists. I saw Maya, I saw Usher. And uh, I can't remember who else I saw there, but mm -hmm. um, that's when I started like wanting to. So uh, a friend of mine from school uh, liked Ray Charles. So we started hearing Ray Charles and then Ray Charles. Mm -hmm. After Ray Charles, we did James Brown because I started liking Michael a lot. And so I did James Brown and then I did Mariah and then I came uh Uh, with Janet Jackson and then after that came Aretha Franklin and Patti LaBelle and all the classics and I already enjoyed uh, Diana Krall but that's a whole different thing and <laughs> and Tony Bennett because I like Big oh, Band a yes. lot I yeah. still do till this I day I can actually hear notes of that influence as well I was gonna say you're very heavy on live instruments and um, big chords and stuff like that and there's yeah. a lot of like doo-wop uh, backgrounds, like um, layers and stuff like that. So I wanted to ask if there was like an old school influence there. And but you saying you like Tony, Tony Bennett? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was just like, wait, I hope I'm saying it right. I hope my mom doesn't like cuss me out. because like, <laughs> She like loves that stuff. So no, that's really awesome. Um, one thing that super compelled me while listening to your uh, other interview, which really made me interested because in this day and age I'm seeing a lot of artists I'm around a lot of artists I used to be an artist myself I was like signed to a record label for a year randomly so I kind of got that firsthand insight and experience on what it takes to be a successful artist because it's you're not just making the music you're not just writing the songs you're actually branding yourself you have to find the look you have to make the connections you have to do the work um so Can you explain everything that goes behind building your music? Like, is it for you, is it just music or, you know, what what is all the involvement and components that go into creating your sophomore album? Uh, well, the sophomore album, as in creating, I wanted to cleanse myself because it all starts with being, uh, you know, ill or wrong at something that you know you're wrong at, you know, mm. with yourself you're you're in the wrong and for me it was obsession and it was uh ocd and mm. you know knowing that i couldn't you know when it got to a point where it was physical then for me it was a pro it started being a problem but in the end it saved my life because i now know that i got that and i know how to control it and i know how not to let it get the best of me Mm -hmm. And if I hadn't gone all the way deep down, you know, I, I, I think it was LL Cool J or, or Ja Rule or someone like that who said, you know, once you hit rock bottom, there's nowhere, nowhere to go but up. Mm -hmm. And I believe that. And I went through that phase, as I said in, in, in that show that you, you heard with uh, Mike Simmons. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I went through that and I survived it. And I remember thinking, you know, if you survive this, you're going to come out of this a better person. And now I do a lot of introspection, even I, I and this is for your viewers to do when you're feeling down. What you got to do is you got to vocalize what you're thinking, because it it's very different to just have it inside your mind. And if you speak it out, it it's a whole different perspective on it, you know, and you start, you know, noticing that it, it might not be as bad as you originally thought when it was mm. inside your head. So. 
I did all that soul searching and I became, you know, very in touch with my emotions, very in touch with my uh, mind. And you know, you start looking for patterns in people and you start, you know, being able to like predict. And I'm not saying that I predict people, but I do come around in certain situations where I can do that stuff. So all that process that started like in 2013, probably to 2016, started uh, making me feel like I, you know, I'd been not really loving the girls I was with, but obsessing about them not leaving me and that I lived with that fear for my whole life. I mm, think a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just, you know, I read, I was reading the Tony Bennett book the other day and it said, you know, the good songs are written out of longing and loneliness. And I was like, whoa, this is exciting because <laughs> I wrote my whole album out of loneliness and oh, longing, wow. Wow. you know, and wanting to, you know, tell, it's like a journal. I remember Janet Jackson once said, you know, I don't write any, I don't have a journal because my albums are my journals. And that stuck in my mind. And when I was writing this album, I said, I just want to, write them letters and tell them everything that they need to know. And most of these girls, they don't even talk to me anymore. <laughs> and so if they hear the songs, they'll know. But if they don't, then someone else will hear it and say, I've been through the same thing and yeah. I'll get through it. And I, 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 I'm not trying to be aspirational or inspirational, but I am trying to get a message across where it's going to be all right. And right. I've been going through that same situation in the past few weeks. But I, now I know that it's going to be all right. And I'm writing a follow-up album to that. But the new album has to be sort of different. So I'm thinking that I'm going to do like a deluxe edition and I'll add a couple of songs, you know, and tell hey, the there stories you go. too. Exactly. Repackage, and so that's, repackage. yeah, and that's how it came about. I, I really wanted to cleanse myself in that regard. I wanted to tell my story. I wanted... I wanted to tell them that it wasn't that that I was like this, you know, really intense guy who who wanted to love them real quick or that needed their love. I just was in need of love in general, not of their relationship, you know, because I think that's how it came across. It came across as, oh, this guy is desperate for me. And I wasn't desperate for them. I wasn't desperate. I was desperate for a purpose. And now my music has turned into that purpose. And so, you know, it all starts coming together. And that's why I didn't want to have shit songs in, in my album. I was telling Mike the other day that I, every time I say that, and I love Britney Spears, <laughs> you know, I, I think of that song that you heard in the interview. I don't want to say it again because I love Britney so much. But, but it was, there's, I think it's there's, awful. There's nothing, I think, when we speak truth about things, like, it's very, it's very difficult. I can understand why... You know, I'm I'm not gonna say I'm not a big fan of Britney. I love her. I know she's an OG. She's been in the game. I have mad respect for her because she's earned that respect. You know, she's she's worked very very hard in the industry. But me personally, it's not a preference of mine. Her music is not a preference of mine. Um, but I can understand in general. I have artists that I love, like Chris Brown, for example. But he has like a 27 song mixtape that I only like three <laughs> songs of. I have no problem saying that. I'm like, Chris Bond, I love you. I think you're mad talented, but there's only like three songs that I like. <laughs> it's not going to kill him, you know, but I, but I'm those songs that I didn't relate to or whatever the kid didn't hit my palate right, whatever the case is. I know, generally speaking, from listening to past projects, every artist tends to have a dud or, you know, one or two songs that may not resonate with that listener. So yeah. I can understand that and I can appreciate the approach that you're taking with your album and taking the time to kind of like bring back that old school process of it's artwork. It's, it's a form of language. It's a form of expression and a way to connect with people um, and bridging the gap. Um, and uh, it's, I appreciate that. I appreciate you taking the time to work on yourself as an artist so that you can be a quality vessel to us listeners because listening to your lyrics, I was like, okay, I can, I can dig it. You're not just saying things like one of the lines that you said, I forget the name of the song, forgive me. Um, but it was love is only for the brave or love is for the brave. Like, R roll the dice. yeah, roll that, that, that's a hard hitting. Like, I'm like, yes, yes. Like that's, that's Facebook quote right there. So yeah. it's, uh, I appreciate that because I know how hard it is to 
work on oneself to have that clarity or to use their art as a form of expression and tap into that vulnerability because like it's scary shit putting yourself out there putting your art out there and standing in your vulnerability so sharing your story about your OCD um thank you for sharing sharing that and I know that there's listeners out there that are probably dealing with something that is getting in their way and obstructing you know their line of sight towards their goals so I was wondering, you know, if you're okay with talking about it, what are some of the tools that you developed or that you use to help you deal with uh, your, you know, obsessiveness or your OCD? Uh, The first one is try to sleep. Mm -hmm. And this is the the people that, that get OCD, you know, even if it's not OCD as a whole, but a minor obsession, which a minor obsession can be a big deal. And, And, you know, this is what, some people, you know, sometimes don't get when you say, oh, maybe it's not OCD. You're just obsessed. But that obsession, even if you don't have the disease, like a diagnose as a whole, I don't want to call it a disease, but, you know, like a diagnose, a professional diagnose, and you have an obsession, it can turn into a big deal. And when it turns into a big deal, sleeping is one of the hardest things. And yeah. yet resting is very important because yeah. it makes you feel like you can outthink everything and, you know, just think it through clearly and be calm and, you know, and you got to have that clarity in your mind. And mm-hmm. if you're not well rested, then you can't do it. So my first, you know, uh, what was the, the term that you used again? <laughs> um, like the tool that you use the, uh, the to tool. help you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, a friend of mine introduced me to meditation a couple of years ago and it really changed me. I use guided meditation, and if I'm allowed to, you know, shout out to someone, is the honest Please, guys. Yeah. They're like this British uh, guys that got like a lot of guided meditations, and his voice is just heaven, like yeah. a meditation for self-esteem, you know. <laughs> Love it. Love and and when I when I'm on an airplane, I'm like, you know, I'm not gonna worry about anything. I'm You'll gonna die a him. healthy mind. <laughs> yes, you're right. I will. Di- I will die happy and healthy. That's amazing. You have to send me their information so we can share it with the viewers. Yeah, I want. Yeah, I, I will. And yeah. so I played them, and I've actually gotten into listening to pre-recorded rain. Oh yeah, nature sounds. Love it. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. The rain. I I normally don't like. I don't like to say I hate something because I don't like that term anymore mm-hmm. but um and I met this guy uh in the Mayan coast who said never say uh you're never gonna do something or that you are not into something you're not ready for it just change that vibe in you and so I'm trying not to say I hate but That's uh, I I do not like um I don't appreciate rain I don't like it uh, so I know it's important and everything, but I do not like when it rains and I am not very fond of watching a movie in a rainy weather. You know, <laughs> I, I don't like that, but I do like pre-recorded rain because it's cool because you hear the sound, you sleep right. soundly. And when you wake up, you just turn it off and you open your curtain and it's sunny outside. So I like yeah. that. And I another thing that's important is if you're having a lot of thoughts, just talk to yourself, but vocalize it and what I mean by vocalize it is actually say it just start talking to yourself but not in your mind because it's very different because we have two two um speakers in our mind it's the speaking mind and the observe the observation I don't know what it's called the the observing mind Uh the observing mind Uh and uh and so uh the speaking mind is like is the one that says oh you fucking bitch you know whatever you know when when you're at a store and then you go like why why did you say that why did you think that she you know uh, whatever and so one is the mind that's observing what the other does so that the, the mind that's responsible for analyzing those thoughts is the one that got to talk. And so when you speak, you're automatically hearing what you're mm-hmm. saying. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. It's, it's, you know, it's strange to say it like that, but you're, no, you, it's... Don't li- you don't listen to yourself when you're thinking. You're just thinking all, all over the place. And it's... when you're analyze, you when you hear something, you analyze it. So you, you got to vocalize that. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm going on on this but it's important you, they gotta vote guys people gotta talk to themselves and i always go when i have a situation that as i said i've been going through a heartache uh, in the past few weeks and i'm not even gonna lie about it and uh 
and when I start, uh, you know, feeling some kind of way, which I know leads to obsession and, you know, paranoia and all those symptoms that won't let me sleep at night and, you know, create that cycle and with all the things that I got to do now and the busy mind, a healthy mind. If you think that, you know, analyzing the thought that you got in your mind and sitting down and giving into your paranoia is going to help, it's not going to help. You got to stay busy. And uh, so I vocalize and I and I go like, whoa look, this is happening because this happened like this. And when she said this and you said that, you know, what you really meant was this, but she probably, and I start explaining myself as if I was talking to another person. And then all of a sudden, so what I do is like, hey, hold it. And I I, I practice this by, you know, doing it in an everyday situation where I, I go to a restaurant. And I, of course, I don't do it in front of girls or, you know, with, with the people that I'm with. But I, I see the menu and I think, so what do you want, darling? You know, I'm talking to myself and I talk to myself as, it, as, as if I was the greatest love of my life because I am. Amazing. And there's no, no one mo- more important than you. And and I always tell my dad this, you know, he's like, oh, because I don't want to cook this because it takes too long. And I'm like, well, if you like it, then cook it for yourself because you're the most important person in your life. Amen. So I try to talk to myself like that and it's all the time it's very recurrent it's not a thing that you can sit and do but it's like it's like it's a lifestyle and you create a habit if you practice it for 21 days so you 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 can always do that and that's those are like some of the things that I do and then or I sing but you know whatever they like to do if you like to shoot hoops then go outside and shoot hoops right something that helped me also is breathing fresh air when you're locked inside your it's horrible and i want to go on and on <laughs> like, we could talk we need three shows to talk about this i think it's very important for people to understand there's a process to this you know like yeah. you are a 10 a 10 time award winning artist and to me that speaks volumes to your work ethic uh and work ethic is something that's developed it doesn't just happen overnight like success doesn't just happen overnight you have been singing since you were nine years old and um I know the hard work that goes behind it but a lot of people they just turn on their camera or they turn on a microphone they post a song online and they're like okay well that's it like that's just let's hope people like listen to my song and Um, I want people to understand and realize, you know, coming from a source as powerful as yourself and especially with all of the accomplishments that you have, to understand that it's it's a process, like the success is a process. It's, um, and that's another thing that you were talking about, how your music has been a progression and you, it's something that you had said, like, you don't consider yourself like a songwriter yet or something like that, but you are, it, it's a progression for you and you're okay with that and you're enjoying that and you're enjoying the, the journey of growing into the type of artist that you want to become. Uh, I don't consider myself a songwriter as much as I, I consider myself an entertainer because I try right. to do it all the time, like entertain people, make them have a good time. And I've seen a lot of great people. I like to hear people's stories because they you learn something. And uh, Jim 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 Carrey used to say, you know, I'm gonna be that carefree person, right? And I'm not a carefree person, but I'm someone who says, you know, take care of yourself, and you're your best friend, and have the best. You don't need anybody else to live a good life, but yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your your journey. And my father's tells me this all the time your your journey is individual there's you know people coming in and out but it's you who's forever with you so Mm -hmm. uh I like to entertain people and make them have a good time because when I'm making them have a good time I start having a good time myself and it takes my it takes my mind off my worries and I tend to worry a lot about everything so I I try to be that person and I think that I think that what makes this album great is that I did not write it expecting anything I wrote Mad Sexy expecting a lot of success and it didn't happen and so when I wrote this album and Mad Sexy was your freshman album that was your first album yeah okay okay and uh and I wrote this one just 
thinking, I'm going to write this album and I'm going to do it for the people who need to hear the stories and feel better about themselves and know that there's a better tomorrow. And if it goes big or something, then, well, that's, you know, that's going to be a consequence of working hard to get it. And yeah, it's just not just posting a song. And I know it happens for some people and it hasn't happened for me. I don't want understand why. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, what do I got to do? Algorithms are crazy. I was just listening to uh, this YouTube video about this producer who just essentially got a quarter of a million subscribers in a year, which is kind of like unheard of. Um, but the way that the algorithm work, his video ended up being a recommended did video or a viral video so he ended up getting all of that traffic so i was like well that's just default like, like wait a second like, yeah if i had good placement i'd probably get like a viral video too but uh no i can i can understand that but those stories are very few and far in between and even if you do become viral i feel like there's like a sense of work ethic that you need to develop to keep up with the status that you get from that video or music or whatever Right. And and, uh, we know we talked about Aretha Franklin um, a few minutes yep. ago, and I remember her saying in an interview that, you know, she came from a time where artists didn't happen overnight, but instead it was a gradual process and they went step in step. Mm. And I, I, it's been happening like that for me, too. And I think that it's perfect because the timings are always perfect. Like I didn't speak like I'm speaking right now to you in front of the camera i think it's good it's not as perfect as i think it should be but i think it's good enough to make myself be understood and um and that's happened because i've i've gathered you know my my fair share of interviews and my fair share of opportunities and and i like i feel that i'm ready for every step that i take because it's been a gradual process and uh my publicist was talking about going to morning shows and I was like, they're not happening now because I need a month or two to, you know, simmer myself more yep. and yep. Um, and be ready for that. And yeah. so when I get there, I'm going to be ready. So what you're saying about the video, you get all these hype and then you don't know how to handle that. And I right. don't think and I that's I, that's why I see all these artists like acting weird. And I don't want to say names, but there's a lot of them who don't um, take advantage of the position that they're in. And right. by, by taking advantage, I mean doing something good for the people or doing something good for themselves right. or just, you know, being a good role model. And I'm not perfect. I, I you know, I'm less than perfect, but I'm trying to be myself and say, hey, I've swam in shit for all this time. You know, I know something, I'm going to share it with you. And that's like kind of the message that I'm trying to get across. And I think that when I, I get that feeling too from the album when I hear it. And I, this is the album from myself that I like to hear a lot. And uh, it's because I like the things that I'm saying. And I like that I didn't hold off on anything that I wanted to say. Like if I wanted to say the name of a girl, I did say it. And uh, if I wanted to tell a story like the one I told in Rule to Dice where I had to, you know, stop seeing a girl because her sister looked better than her. And I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in love with her sister in a month. And this is not fair to you, not fair to me, not yeah. fair to her. Yeah. Because you know, she doesn't get to experience me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. No, but that's cool. That's, that's what music is about. It's speaking from direct experience. And I can 1,000% relate to what you're saying about everything that we go through is just kind of like us priming or it's shaping us or giving us the experience. So when we do get that opportunity, you know, that's going to really make the difference in our career, or your career, we'll be ready for it and be exactly. prepared for it. Like, um, I have dreams of eventually, you know, interviewing some really big names but when I think about it when I'm being actually truthful and taking accountability for my story I'm like Rissa are you actually really ready is like fuck no I'm not ready like I'm not <laughs> I'm not there yet I know I have to you know there's a lot of things that I have to kind of sharpen so when I get to the level I have that professionalism or I have that reference point where I'm just like okay I've been here before I can do this I'm gonna be an Oprah you know like whatever whatever this turns into I'm not defining it I'm just enjoying the ride and just knowing that there's a calling here and and I'm sure you feel that too you're just like I don't know what it is I don't know why I just know that I'm supposed to do it and I love doing it and it makes people happy 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's and you said the word. It's being ready for it. And you, I like, I love being ready for every step that I take, and I love being ready just for life in general. Cause I, it's it's funny because when when I was really little and I started recording the demos and I was like nine years old and I didn't know anything about a booth or the studio or how writing songs worked and anything. I remember getting this feeling like I'm gonna be somebody someday. I don't know what day. And and it's funny and I don't want to sound stuck up when I say this, but I go to a party and I, I remember I remember girls watching me and I figured out, you know, you're you're with a hotter man than me and um at that time with no self esteem and stuff. You you're nothing special. Why is she looking at me? But there was always this vibe and uh, you you mentioned Keno Thomas. I met him uh, through Constructive Criticism, which is a show on Facebook, and uh, and mm-hmm. We're, mm-hmm. we're working on a project right now together. And uh, and uh, I gotta actually call him right after this. And uh, <laughs> and at, in that show, Disciple always says, you know, you you're gonna see and Garen on TV. And when you see when you see and Garen on TV, just don't forget that I said it first. And I said it here on constructive criticism. And I I don't want to sound stuck up when I say that, but I always I always remember Nicki Minaj and I do not like Nicki Minaj, you know, as an artist, but you know, I respect her for where she is at. And uh and um and she she used to tell the story where she was like she was like doing a sort of off Broadway play or something like that, and she got fired and she they were like, Jen, you're not talented, you're never gonna make it. And she was like she went out of there and she 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 thought to herself don't you know who i am and she was no one she was like 19 years old and literally a nobody and she thought to herself don't you know who i am and i always relate to that when i try to explain this because i always felt like i was going to be something important and now i know that it's not just for the fame for the money or for you know because when you're you, when you're little you just think oh you you want to be famous and i don't know if i like that sort of fame like i was thinking about this the other day and i was thinking i want to be like medium famous and i, I don't want to put a <laughs> hold on the universe you know i'm always i i i'm always saying that word that you said a, a moment ago universe whenever i'm ready for this just give it to me Okay. Mm-hmm. Whenever the record is ready to be successful, let me release it. And uh, mm-hmm. so I don't want to, you know, make any decrees or anything. But I was thinking, I don't want to be Michael Jackson famous. That's like mm-hmm. hell. I don't want to. I don't want to be that kind of famous. I want to be known for being a good person and just being able to share this, this with people and you know my experience and have them share my ex- their experiences with me and I've talked to people that I do not know and I try to be cautious about it because you know we live in an uh, in, in a world where everything can be twisted but uh, there's been people who you know message me and I talk with them for a moment and and they're and I'm like whenever you need help and I, after like I tell them what I think about what they're telling me they're like why are you helping me and I'm like well, because I would have liked to have that help when I needed that. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I don't, I'm not any like any sort of humanitarian or so it's but I'm just trying to be a good person in this world. You don't need to be a need. humanitarian to be human, you know, like exactly. it, it doesn't we take need, much to be human. Yes. We need a, a <laughs> world, you know, where and sometimes and the, the part that I like the most about, you know, being uh, able to have this platform and, you know, talk to you and do all these sorts of stuff is that I get I, I had all these thoughts and I went out with girls and they never got me. And I was like, God, I wish I could be with a girl that that could understand me. And now that I get to, you know, speak my mind and mm-hmm. I, I don't feel that need anymore so it's been a cleansing experience for me too and a healing experience and a learning experience and I've I, you know I like to learn every day and I hear my interviews and I'm like okay give shorter answers which I'm not doing now so I'm gonna let <laughs> you speak now <laughs> well I I'm kind of my platform is a little different I purposely ask very proning questions to get to like the deeper layer of things. Um, I'm more focused or I like to, my curiosity is more about the person's journey because 
nothing is an overnight success. It's it's like, yeah, I can talk about, you know, the the 10 different awards that you got and stuff like that. And, and, and that's not to downplay any of your successes at all. It's more of like, what kind of mindset do you need to develop and do you need to have? What kind of philosophy, what kind of work ethic, what kind of values does this person have to bravely a put themselves out there and then consistently put themselves out there knowing that there's going to be critique, knowing that there's going to be criticism, knowing that there's guaranteed failure because the higher and farther that you shoot, the harder that you're going to fall. But the idea is to get back up and to learn from those failures. Like I've gotten to the point where I look forward to failing. I've already embraced the fact that like, if I'm trying something new, I'm going to fuck up. Like I'm going to, I'm going to fail. I'm not going to get it right on the first time. And I'm okay with that. And in fact, I love myself even more for being brave enough to even try it and not to be hard on myself that, you know, I put a video up two weeks ago and it's only at 30 views. It's like, okay, I'm not going to, you know, like, I'm not going to let the numbers phase me. I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to continue. I'm going to be consistent. So when I see artists like that who are kind of going on the same journey and just emphasizing to, there's so many people around me who are so dope, but they don't do the work necessary on themselves and on their actual projects and their brands to really make an impact and reach the people because it takes a lot of work. And I think a lot of people are scared of that, like scared of success. So that's why I'm like, yeah, we can talk about this all day. We can go super deep, but I want people to see, and I want people to realize that it is absolutely possible no matter what life, what walk of life you come from to unapologetically go after what it is that you want and to create opportunity for yourself regardless of the cards that you were dealt in life. That's interesting that you mentioned that because I, you know, I can, you know, round it up and a, a quote that I read on, on Instagram a few days ago, and we were just talking about how people don't do the work that they're supposed to. They're just going on Instagram and, you know, reading Motivation Mafia and, you know, thinking, oh, I, I think of it as micro Posting a picture, and, reading a book, like it's like, okay, but like, yeah, <laughs> I think it's like micro dosing. They're just like, they, mm. they feel good for that, for that moment, but they're not doing all that it takes to have that feeling for good in themselves. Mm -hmm. So, so they just use it like that. But I read a post and it's ironic that I use the post as an example, given the fact, but <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, like an infomercial and in giving, you know, the whole thing where you got to do the work. You, I'm like the small letters at the bottom where you, <laughs> you, no you got to exercise, yep. <laughs> exercise and eat right or it, it won't work. And, yep. uh, and uh, it said that uh, you shouldn't quit. And I wasn't thinking about quitting when I read it, but it said that, uh, that you shouldn't quit because you're right, right now you are where you want it to be. A few months ago when you and first they, started yeah, yeah yeah and and that you that you're here because you did the work and you didn't quit so in some time you're gonna be where you'd want to be right now mm -hmm. but it was right like now, something like when you first started you wished you wished you were where you are right now exactly like, I remember and, that quote yeah yeah and I thought to myself I, I when I uh, was gonna put the record out I thought I wish I can have a lot of interviews, but I don't wish to spend all the money in traveling to do those interviews. So mm -hmm. the the more I can do like this way, the better. And they've all happened, you know, I've had a ton. And I, and when I saw that, I, I thought to myself, you're doing exactly what you wanted to do a few months ago. So this is right. <laughs> so yep. you, you're, you're going to be where you want to be right now in a few months or in a few weeks. But it takes it, – it's a whole process of it that you should be learning from. Mm -hmm. uh, it's – we we talked about that thing where there's no way to go but up. And I don't think that you ever want to reach the top on anything that you do because that means you've stopped learning. And that shouldn't, mm. you know, be in the cards for anyone to stop learning. That's powerful. That's powerful. And I'm I'm guilty myself of falling into that way of thinking. Like, I've just recently – climbed up out of this like really deep dark funk of not being motivated and just kind of 
just feeling deflated and looking at success as a destination as opposed to like a process and a way of living and like a mindset. And um, that's why what you said really resonates with me because it's absolutely a lifestyle. Like you should never want to reach a final destination. You should want to achieve your goal, then set a new goal for yourself right away. And that just keeps going until, you know, we're, we're turned into dust again. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you know, uh we talked about Jim Carrey a while back and he said that uh, he's got this quote that says that I wish that everyone had everything they dreamed of on all the money in the world and the fame and the fortune uh, so that they could see that it's not the answer. And I think mm-hmm. uh you know, it's easier to say it when you're Jim Carrey, of course, but <laughs> but it's also true like like I, I I don't want to say that people you know are giving up on stuff, but I read a lot of uh, uh, of my friends on Facebook that are just like trying to let go of stuff, and oh, it it even happens in relationships. What you know, I I see right now in like in love relationships uh, is that people don't want to commit. I myself mm-hmm. have commitment issue, issues, but uh, people don't want to come in and they they come they say, oh, you're really intense, and I'm like, no, I'm passionate, and I got passion for everything that I do, and if and I'm gonna say this because it's funny, I I thought I just said it in my head, so it it'll, it'll work. <laughs> I'm passionate <laughs> about everything I do, so if I'm doing you, I'm gonna be passionate about you too, right? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> So, that's hilarious <laughs> so but people are afraid of commitment people are afraid to be loved they don't know how to be loved they don't know how to be well treated like i've been out with girls that don't even know uh what uh pulling their chair or opening the door for them means guilty i don't know if that's a testament to our culture or but i'm definitely one of those i'm definitely one of those women that never got to experience or Actually, my current relationship, I am experiencing that. But before that, prior to that, that's not really in the cards for us over here. Like, especially, like, in the U.S., like, the culture of dating. And I have this conversation all the time. I've written a blog about this. But, like, I think the actual concept of dating is dead. And it's completely turned superficial and physical and trying to connect with someone and bond with someone. That's just, it's, like, fizzled out. Like, it's crazy. Like people look at me so crazy when I just want to have a conversation. They're just like, what, why are you asking me so many questions? I'm like, cause I want to fucking get to know you. Like what the (laughs) fuck? I don't know you. So like, yeah, no, I, I, and it's, it's one of those things that I realized that when I finally met my boyfriend now who showed me like how, you know, a woman should be treated. Like he's the first one to pull the chair out for me. And I was like, but did you need me to move it? Like, what's, why are you with chair up? He was like, oh my God, I've never, that's never, I've never done that before. But that made me realize like, wow, like I never, number one, A, knew that this option was available for myself or I never thought myself worthy enough to have this type of love, let alone, I don't think I've done the work to even receive this type of love properly. Cause like, I don't, I don't know how to receive this. I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> so I definitely one of those girls and I can relate to that, but upon doing the self work upon, you know, getting out of the little depression that I was in and recreating the love for myself, I'm all like, you better pull that chair out for me. Cause like, I'm exactly. totally worth it. Yeah. Absolutely. I always joke around with my friends, <laughs> even if they're my friends, because I do it. I don't just do it for the girl I'm seeing. I do it for my mother. I do it for my sister. My sister doesn't really like it, but I do it anyway. And like, um, I'm a gentleman, damn it. <laughs> yeah, and I do it for my friends too, for my like girlfriends and my actual girlfriends. I I I do them. I do it for all of them. And when I joke around with them when when I do it, because when they they like freak out about it, I'm like. Who are you seeing? Uh, they're my friends. I'll, I'll go like, who are you seeing? They, you know, yeah. you know, the, watch those manners, man. Like, come on, you yeah. know. So I try it, cause they're going back to a little bit of Tony Bennett. And I know I quote a lot, and I said this in interviews before, but I read a lot of the people that I I admire. I read a lot. I don't listen to the people that I don't admire. Like you the learn a that lot I, about yourself when you're learning about others. I feel. Yeah, and I, yeah, because I'm really introspective, and I reflect a lot on how 
my actions affect others and how their actions are affecting me and you know the the way I operate and what I'm thinking and how I'm feeling and stuff so I I think that you know I I sorry I got off no track. you're fine and that's fine Tony Bennett says that glamour never goes out of style and he, when he said that, when he said that in his documentary, in his Netflix documentary, he was referring, uh, uh, he was talking about the tie, and he was talking about uh, his shoes, and you know stuff that is important to him. But to me, it was like glamour never goes out of style. So a gentleman is glamorous, and I sh- we should never go out of style. But it's giving mm, me a hard tell, time tell because mm-hmm. girls, girls don't <laughs> understand that, like really. They don't, and I've had a hard time because of that, you know, lack of appreciation, and yeah. I'm not blaming them. I'm blaming, you know, the world for it because we, we're we not – well, we live in a world where no one's respecting anything, so mm-hmm. I, I'm like, who's, who's teaching you not to, you know – it's not – that I want to win you over. It's that this is who I am, and I'm right. always going to treat you this way. Right. And – and I, I I like to be more successful at dating. And we were playing around the other day in an interview that I did. And he was like, no, he just shuts up and plays his music and goes like, oh, that's mine. And they were treating me like I was this sort of ladies man, which I think I am adorable. And I get a lot of girls because of that. But I also, you know, want to be myself. And mm-hmm. I'm really passionate about everything so as I said if I'm you know what I said before where you know I'm passionate about everything I do so I, like I love that, that. that's a great line that's such a great line if that was it to me I'd be like okay you get points for creativity that was clever. that was clever no yeah but yeah that's that's it's very it's interesting to hear that because a I admire you completely embracing who you are and just being like this is who I am. I have a very like intense and genuine kind of love. If you can't handle it, then like I don't know what to tell you. But it's also like interesting to see how many women out there, me, you used to be one of those that just doesn't recognize that, and we look at that as like okay, that's weird. Like why? Like it shouldn't be. Being treated well should not be weird. Like, it shouldn't be, like, (laughs) like a foreign thing to us, you know? But unfortunately, with, like, the... And this is why I don't have cable TV. Like, the type of programs and the stuff that's, like, force-fed to us on social media, if you don't have a conscious brain, if you don't have awareness, if if you don't know who you truly are outside of the social media stuff you will get caught up in what society is telling you to do. And right now, the cultural climate is all about smash and dash. It's all about Tumblr. It's all about hitting and quitting, Netflix and chilling. Like, they're even TV shows, like, they don't talk about working out relationships or communicating or, you know, we stick it out through the tough times. Like, as soon as something gets hard, people are like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, it's it's, it's like, dude, this is our first fight. Like, what? Like, what do you mean? So it's, it's, uh, I admire that. I admire you for just wholeheartedly being like, this is what it is if you can't handle it and not dumbing yourself down or not changing yourself just to make someone feel comfortable, you know? Yeah, because when you see it happen, and I've seen it happen in, in my family a lot with some of my cousins, you know, not the closer ones, but, but I've seen them do that where they are working a girl and, uh, something that I take a lot of pride in is I've never lied to get a girl, even in bed, even for a one night stand. I've never lied. I can I can do the jerky thing where I'm not paying attention, and you know I did this uh, recently and it worked. And that comes around with what we were talking about: being well treated shouldn't be something that freaks That's out. That's like weird, right? <laughs> something foreign, you know. But you know, given the fact that uh, treating girls well wasn't, you know, profit. I wasn't profiting for that as much. Right. Then I, I did what's, what's closest to me, which is I'm not going to pay any, any attention to you. Mm-hmm. And, and the less attention I pay, the more interested you're going to be. And that's as far as I'm going to go. Cause I don't like m- men who, who talk in a certain way or who, verbally mistreat or try to play it cool you know yeah, I, I yeah and I see girls that 
like be to be treated that way, but I'm not like that. So as far so as I went, all the ladies, all of the ladies to listen and hear that. Are you single? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. So, ladies, I need you to listen and I need you to hear this. Uh, like, good men still do exist. So, guys, please. No, I'm just kidding. I don't want them to, like, bombard your DMs. Don't bombard. Don't be weird. Don't bombard his DMs or anything. No, do it. <laughs> do it. I like, I, like, I like conversation. And, I, you know, I'm, I was going to say I'm single and not so ready to mingle. But I am ready, you know. You're never ready to. He's single and to, open for conversation. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're never ready to do what scares you. And. You know, right. I, I'm trying to be different in that way. And and so I tried that and it worked out. And I was like, well, maybe I should be, you know, doing this more often where I'm not that interested. But when I'm in, when I really like a girl, I'm really interested. Like, I can't yeah. help it. If I like yeah. it, I like it. And there's like, like there's this blogger I follow. She just likes my comments and stuff. But she's so cute. And so I like to tell her, like, you're cute. Wow, that color looks amazing on you. I always mm-hmm. try to, you know, I, you know, <laughs> and even if she doesn't read it, I don't care. I can't help it. It makes me feel good to do it. Yeah. So, and I, as I said, I never lied to get anyone in bed because I thought that was despicable. It feels like cheating on a test, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm glad you look at it that way because uh, not a lot of people have those morals. So like, it's very nice to know that there are still some good men out there. So like kudos to you, ladies. Yeah, and <laughs> but curiously, my record is about long longing and, and loneliness, you know, which is means with, for the guys, I guess it means that it's not as successful to be a good guy. But I, I'd say be a good guy. Don't be an, don't be the nice guy. The nice guy, you know, like the the friend, the the the, the man that's that becomes the girlfriend, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. that you know tell that gets to listen about her boyfriends and it's all it's eternally heartbroken. That's a nice guy, but the good guy is a good guy. Like I'm a good guy, but I won't be fucked around with. Right, a good guy that's with like, boundaries. Yeah, the difference. <laughs> so, yeah. and when when I write those songs. I, I tell the truth and I, I'm going to give it away because I, I'm loving this conversation and, you know, people Yay. are probably going to forget by the time it's out and they're going to say, oh, he said it at, you know, Coats or Fuzz. And I wrote <laughs> I wrote this song. I haven't released it and it's for the next album and it's called Love Me Back. And it says, like, we will, we will spin around the world all summer, go to Mykonos and live like lovers. Eat and chill and we will eat each other when you love me back, babe. <laughs> you oh, know? And, I like that. And it starts talking about how, because it reminded me of that when you said that, you know, we live in an era where it's Netflix and chill and letting go and everything is just so slow paced. And, you know, if it's making you feel uncomfortable, then you shouldn't deal with it and just instead, you know, throw it under the rug. And right. it talks about that, that you know, that, that in this times, love isn't uh well exactly what you said it's not uh, appreciated you know as it should to the point where you have to make you want to make it work with somebody that you know yeah. you got something special because well i'll get into that because my mind is throwing like a lot of ideas and um and when you know it talks about you know everyone is hating on love but they all love to have it mm. so when you love me back then we can do all this. And, I, and the, the reason why I chose Mykonos is because I think it's a very romantic place to be with someone. <laughs> have I love it. Friends. Have you been there before? No, but I have a lot of friends who've been there recently. You know, where we were talking, you know how everything comes around? Because we were talking about, you know, how everything is pieced out together and yep. it goes full circle. And I have a lot of friends who've been there recently and, you know, have a lot of Insta stories you know, from those terraces mm-hmm. and stuff. And I saw that and I was like, this, it would be so romantic to be with someone there. So that's why yeah. I chose that city. Dope. And well, I'm a hopeless romantic, even if I don't like to accept it. I I'm love it. I was going to say, it was <laughs> like, you're, you're such a romantic. Like, that's amazing. Like, no, I have guy friends who are romantics too. And I love it. Like it's, it's, uh, you're not afraid of being in touch with like your feelings and what makes you happy. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, like it's, it's just makes you who you are. And I think that um, putting that, fa- putting on that facade of like, 
like the good guy and the bad guy or like whatever I I ultimately think like just be yourself you know whatever that is like if you whatever your interests are as long as you stay true to yourself you're gonna attract that person who is a good fit for you because you're not Mm -hmm. acting like someone else you're not being a you know you're not not pretending to be someone else like you are wholeheartedly and unapologetically authentic you and you're very much like this is what it is if you don't like it then don't take it and by standing in that truth you're going to you're going to find someone who fits perfect like a puzzle you know and that's that's amazing yeah and you're going to attract everyone not just that perfect fit because confidence is attractive in the end true this is true cuz you know very I, true. Someone asked me the other day, and it wasn't in an interview, it was just regular conversation. Someone said, uh, girls are more attracted to guys with big arms. And they were describing what they were attracted to physically. And I said, no, girls are attracted to confidence. If you're a confident mm-hmm. man, it doesn't – look at Prince. He didn't have big arms. He was like – and he wore high heel shoes, and he got all the bitches. <laughs> and and the you know he he was a confident man. Yeah. And that's the most attractive thing. And we men, and I'm not trying to you know, um, how do you talk smack about us, run my mouth about it? How do you say that? Uh, I, I got to talk to know you had to write talk smack, talk shit, like yeah. Yeah, about us men, but we're more attracted to. To, you know, the way if a girl looks how we like her and she looks right physically, mm-hmm. then then what we try to do is we try to fit her physical, our physical attraction into her personality. So we try to adjust to everything that's mm-hmm. with her personality. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. and I that's think just it happens, science. <laughs> yeah. And it happens both ways. But I think uh, the Guy, guys, what they do is, you know, try to do it every time. And girls, if you're a confident man, they don't need to be, you know, adapting themselves to you. They don't even have to like you physically. Like, they just have to be like, oh, well, he's not nasty. That's <laughs> my, my, my aunt always says, the, the, if, he does, if, if you don't think, wow, he's disgusting, that's the first step to love. <laughs> And, you know, and so I'm like, well, I might not be her type or I might be her type, but I'm sure going to make an impression. And I'm not preparing for that. I just try to walk up to them and just be myself. But that's the problem of this era. They don't like to you. They don't like you to be yourself because right. they're just, you know, like, like, what are you doing? I'm, I'm like, I'm being myself. Like, I thought of Tommy Lee right now. When he when he said that the first time he met Pam Anderson, he went over to her. And, of course, he's a rock star and stuff. He gets to be do things. But, well, in the Me Too era, no one gets to do that. He came over to her and he licked her face. You know, oh, yeah, he you was, could not do that today. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. You can't even imply that you want to do it. Right. <laughs> Going to but, jail, yep. But it's that freedom to be yourself that was – that's allowed that – you that Girls got to allow and men got to allow too because girls, you don't, you, you can't. I think the pro, I was going to say that a few minutes back. I was going to say the, I think the problem with that is social media because when you go out with somebody, if you don't meet somebody at a bar, which isn't that often anymore, it's not that common because of the safety, you know, issues and stuff. If you're going to go on a date with someone, you can, search them online and you know their every bit of information before you're there yeah so my and my singing coach always used to tell me why don't you forget that she exists till the day you meet up and I was like no I can't because I saw this and and she was like I want you to forget about her till you meet in person because if not what you're going to do is you're going to come with a whole movie in your head of how she's supposed to be and the minute she she's not fitting your expectations you're not going to like her and you're immediately going to think that she's rejecting you just because she's not fitting into your mode oh wow <laughs> yeah. that's excellent advice wow yeah and i said yeah well right but i'm still going to research <laughs> her you're I'm, like okay <laughs> i'm single and ready to mingle so we all know how that went <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right when there's a will there's a way no i totally get it but 
Yeah, we could totally talk about that for hours, but I just wanted to ultimately, you know, start wrapping this up because I think it's been like an hour, almost an hour. Um, but album is amazing. You guys have got to listen to his sophomore album, Irreplaceable. My favorite song, Roll the Dice. Um, the sound it's got, like, it's just, it's just so nostalgic to me. I remember growing up, uh, my mom, my mom, my parents used to play a lot of Tony Braxton, Janet Jackson, Erica Badu, you know, like Earth, Wind and Fire. So when I hear chords like that, or when I hear percussion and a lot of like live instruments, I think of my childhood and I think about the weekends and like when we heard music like that, it was a Sunday and we knew it was time to clean. Like as soon as we heard <laughs> Eric Badu, we're like, oh shit, we gotta clean the bathroom. Okay. But think about it now, it's like, it brings me back to that. And it, it's, I uh, really enjoyed it. I really liked your, your body of work and um, I enjoyed your process and the vulnerability that you utilize to create the lyrics, create the song. Cause you can tell, you can hear it. It's not like, you know, like very shallow rap songs that I hear, like, don't get me wrong. I like, I like a good twerking song, but I'm a woman of substance. I like to be stimulated. I like to get into my feelings. And I remember before the internet, before streaming, I had a CD player and my headphones and I would be in my room and I would just listen to the music and just get lost. And it's been a very long time since I've been able to listen to music like that, where I just get lost in the stuff. And your um, music definitely has that component where, you know, someone can just kind of get lost in your world. And uh, I appreciate that. And I hope that you continue to make music like that. Thank you. And I, uh, I sure will. Cause you know, I love, I love great twerking too, but it, I leave that to someone else and it's a different kind of talent. I'm not going to say it's talent less, but it's for, for someone that's not me. And mm -hmm. well, I can't help being me and I do it through song. And I appreciate that you say all these things that I've been waiting like 20 years to hear. Because <laughs> no, for real, because when you were saying that, I was like, whoa, she really gets me. And you know how misunderstood I've been in my inner circle for a very long time where, mm -hmm. where, you know, not just my family, but in general, my friends at school and the people that were around me never got me. And I was like, can't you see that I'm excited because I read this one word and my cousin in particular, I remember this example, I heard an R. Kelly song and, you know, I know R. Kelly is a little controversial to say that I hear R. Kelly, but Drea Kelly, her ex-wife, gave us all a pass when she said, if you like R. Kelly, but you're in conflict with what he's done, you know, and you want to keep listening to his music because he, it's pretty great music and because she profits out of it too, <laughs> uh, you know, then what you got to remember is R. Kelly is a great artist and Robert is a bad man. So when she did that separation, I could live with that. And I continue mm. to listen to R. Kelly, and I think it's very fair that, that she did that because I, I saw a lot of people who were in the same conflict as me. Is that should I listen? Should I not? And I including I, myself, I, I appreciate I appreciate that philosophy because I have that same conflict with R. R. Kelly. Like he's a huge staple and very very talented musician, but I was not able to separate his situation from his music and you. Verbal, you you putting that perspective out there gives me something different to chew on, and maybe it'll give the viewer something different to chew on. So I appreciate you sharing that, yeah, because I was like, oh, I didn't think about it like that. Yeah, and and it's yeah, it's just he, it's the song is irrelevant for the example, but I remember he he came up with this song, and I heard the words, and I was so excited, and I came up to my cousin and I said, man, you gotta listen to this, and I played it to him like, and he was like, oh, it's okay, and I was like, no, 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 it's it's more than okay. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we talk songwriting, I think Mariah Carey is the queen of them all, you know. Miss mm, Mariah. I, I, yeah, I love Mariah. And everyone got to go do justice for caution. And I don't want to, you know, help her promote the album. She's got enough money writing on that. But, but Caution is a great album. And so, well, that was the example. And he said, well, I can't hear anything special. And what I'm trying to say by this is not necessarily the R. Kelly song or his reaction in general, but it's been my whole life I've been, you know, feeling that way as his reaction, 
you know, where I don't see the specialness in this. And the, the things you said right now, and I said, I've been waiting 20 years to hear them, is because you got to the point where you really got me. And you, make, you made me feel like I'm doing something right. And that is a great feeling to take home. I'm actually home, but, <laughs> you know, no, but to yeah, take I, from good. this culture fuzz experience. And I, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of your work and you got this great smile, this great vibe and great hair. I appreciate and, uh, that. You know, it's, Thank you. You know, it's my, it's my staple. It's, it's branding at the end of the day. No, but I appreciate that. That is my overall goal is to create a safe space for people like you who already put themselves out there to have these vulnerable conversations and some of the topics that we talked about. I really appreciate you putting yourself out there and having those Thank you. conversations because these are the type of conversations that I think more people need to hear and more people need to have. And we're all human. We're all going after the same thing. We all experience the same thing. And when you were saying, you know, I feel misunderstood in my circle I just did a video with one of my other friends who has a radio uh, show talking about tribe and how important it is to be around like-minded people to help you along your, your journey because it can, as you know, it can get very dark, it can get very lonely. And we, sometimes we just need cheerleaders and people to remind us like why we're doing what we're doing. And that's what Culture Fuzz is about is to create that tribe for people to just have these conversations and know that you know, and I want to work as that bridge to connect people. Possibly if someone sees this video, they want to reach out to you or, you know, you see someone else in a video, you want to reach out to them to serve as that bridge. And that's why I'm bridging the gap to just help people have these fucking conversations, <laughs> like <laughs> to just put themselves out there and just to know that, you know, if we just tap into our empathy, we tap into our vulnerability and we tap into our sympathy, like we can seriously change the game and we can remember what it's like to truly connect with people. Um, so thank you. I really, really thank you for your energy. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your music, for your gifts. Um, I um, am able to read musicians very well because I, I come from, uh, I'm around music a lot, a lot, a lot. I Music runs in my family. So um, when I listen to music, I really, really pick it apart. And um, artists, especially I can tell a lot about an artist through their music. So hearing bits and pieces and your your project as a whole and speaking to you, um, I'm very excited for your future. I'm very excited for people to experience your light, to experience your music. Um, and I'm astounded by your work ethic. And I know, I know you're going to be huge. And I'm very honored to catch you right before the wave takes off because I know it's going to be big. I know it's going to be big. So why don't you tell my Culture Fuzz viewers, you are now part of the Culture Fuzz family, the rest of the family members, where they can find your music, how they can reach out to you, because um, my phone is about to die. So <laughs> I'll get this as fast as possible. <laughs> okay, well, uh, first and foremost, thank you for the kind words. Like I know they're more than just kind words. I really felt a connection, and I hope that we can be okay. friends off camera. Whenever, Absolutely. you know, we, you, what I've said here is the truth. And I'm thinking, you know, we better be friends or there's going to be problems. <laughs> Janet Jackson <laughs> should come on this show and speak her oh, wow. truth. Cause wow. yeah, she cool. needs an outlet that, that treats her like a human, not right. someone who's like, Oh, Miss Jackson is here. No, someone like, Hey Janet, just have, have a cup of coffee and, speak it out <laughs> I'll just talk so, yeah so what I was gonna say Dope. Uh, thank you I, I think that we're gonna have uh more shows together and it'll be oh, yeah. in many different outlets because you're gonna be big and you got this whole charisma going on and this vibe you know you just turned my day upside down it wasn't as good and it's now gonna be remembered as a day where you made me feel like I'm worth. Oh, I'm that's... beaming. I did my job. Yes. That makes yeah. me so happy, Ian. Thank and you. <laughs> you really did. And it's not that I feel unworthy, but, you know, there's, as Snoop Dogg would say, my mom always said that there'd be days like this, and you really turn it around. And if you can turn that around with that charisma, you're going to not only help propel a lot of artists, but you're going to turn a lot of you know, mainstream artists into humans again in the eyes of people and in the eyes of themselves. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Oh my god! And you before the yeah. phone dies, <laughs> uh, my like social media um, platforms are uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can all go to I am Ian Garen, and Garen is G U E R I N. I am Ian Garen, and Garen again is G U E R I N. It's yes. on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook slash I am Ian Garen. And my music, the Irreplaceable album, is available everywhere. These are Amazon, Google Play, Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes. Uh, the streaming service that people are using, it's right up there, including Pandora, which I'd been trying to get into for the past three years, and I, now I'm in. Ooh, yes. Just yesterday, <laughs> and this is new. Now I can say it. I'm in Pandora, finally. I don't know what makes it so special, but but... You know, Whatever, I couldn't get in. Whatever, a platform is a platform. So that's so basically, we have no excuse to find your music. You are everywhere. Music everywhere. is streaming. Got it. Okay, so yep. guys, link will be in my description box. Um, you guys, Ian Garen, he is amazing. Reach out to him. Take advantage, especially of artists who are accessible and are here and willing to have that conversation. Ian, thank you again so much for being on Culture Fest Conversations. This will not be the last time. I know as soon as you come out with some more music, I want you right back on the show. Anytime you come out to LA, I want us to do an in-person. We're going to make it work. And thank you so much, hon. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And for sure, for sure, I will do that in person in a couple of months because I am I am going. So hey, thank you so much. Very <laughs> cool. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it.